Thank you, uh, Yu Chen. Good morning, Sanya, and good evening to our speakers and audience in most other time zones. Welcome all to session five of the 2021 Symposium on Global Cooperation and Ocean Governance. I am confident that those who are here online would prefer, like me, to be in Sanya in person with you. Our session is focused on ocean government practices in the Arctic, and we have distinguished speakers who are also experts on these issues. Without delay, let's get started. First, I'll introduce our first speaker, Dr. Aldo Cherkov, who is Professor of Law and Canada Research Chair in Maritime Law and Policy. He is originally from Malta, but for decades, his home has been in Canada, based at the Marine and Environmental Law Institute at Dalhousie University. His field of research and teaching are, include Canadian maritime law, international maritime law, law of the sea. His most recent book is Governance of Arctic Shipping, Rethinking Risk, the Human Impacts and Regulation. Uh, Dr. Chickup, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Gordon. Let me put on the share screen function. And let me first of all, uh, thank the organizers for uh, kindly inviting me to speak uh, uh, to, this, uh, to this meeting. And uh, in particular to share um, the experience of a rather novel initiative for the governance of shipping in Canadian Arctic waters. So the topic, the title of my presentation is low impact shipping corridors in Canadian Arctic waters. And I raised the question um, as to whether this is an emerging good governance uh, practice. And by way of an outline for my presentation, I, I will offer a few words of introduction um, to, to the topic, and then uh, uh, perhaps uh, um, explain what are the conditions for navigating Canadian Arctic waters, which perhaps the audience might not be familiar with. And then I will introduce the corridors initiative and I will then proceed to discuss it and offer some concluding thoughts. So the first thing to observe is the context. Um, the context of Arctic Canada is immense. You're looking at a coastline of 162,000 kilometers and uh, approximately 4 million kilometers of water enclosed uh, therein. So the first point here is the geographical scope. But at the same time, we have to layer on this the impacts of climate change on this geographical scope. It is rendering this region increasingly more accessible. So those times when we had fairly impenetrable ice cover are perhaps behind us now. And instead, what we're beginning to see is a longer summer navigation season. And in fact, uh, with uh, um, conditions that have been moderate enough to enable even recreational vessels to navigate in the Northwest Passage. And increasingly we see more of these uh, recreational vessels such as yachts, for instance, as well as other forms of tourism, including uh, cruise ships. But uh, at this time, of course, the majority of shipping in Canadian Arctic waters is really uh, local commercial traffic, uh, the type that provides logistics uh, in the North perhaps exporting uh, minerals from the north, what we call destination traffic, and of course, government uh, vessels and research vessels. So we are not seeing the kind of traffic that there is on the Russian Northern Sea route. But nonetheless, the long-term projections are that we will see greater shipping. And what we have to bear in mind is that uh, much of this region 
is not uh, properly charted. And indeed, we have already had a number of uh, incidents, including the grounding of uh, passenger vessels. Uh, the first was in 1996, the Hanseatic, uh, a German small passenger vessel. Then we had the Clipper Adventure in 2010, more recently the Academic uh, Joffe. We've been very lucky that we have not really had instances of death or serious uh, injuries or even large uh, pollution incidents as yet. But that is really a matter of luck and we cannot simply rely on luck in planning shipping in the north. The other thing that we need to bear in mind about Canadian Arctic waters is that uh, the Northwest Passage is not just a navigation route, it is Inuit Nonangat, which in Inuktitut means the homeland of Inuit. And what we have to bear in mind too is the Inuit as an indigenous peoples enjoy rights at customary international law, at indigenous law, as well as domestic law in Canada. So that's the constitutional law, uh, we're looking at legislation as well as the, as the common law. And uh, an important development in the Canadian context too is that um, we are undergoing a process of reconciliation with our indigenous peoples and rethinking how engagement uh, ought to take place in a respectful manner. So in thinking about the governance of Arctic shipping, it is absolutely essential in the Canadian Arctic context to think in terms of the lens of reconciliation and how uh, Indigenous peoples are going to be engaged in this governance process. We know also that there is growing interest in shipping corridors as a concept, and indeed the Arctic Council, the Protection of the Arctic Marine Environment Working Group, has been looking at this and earlier this year produced a report, a first report, which uh, consists of uh, the experiences of the eight Arctic states so far on measures that they have taken to protect the Arctic marine environment from shipping. And against that backdrop, there is the Canadian initiative launched by the Canadian Coast Guard Transport Canada and the Canadian Hydrographic Service to designate low impact shipping corridors in Canadian Arctic waters. And indeed, at this time, there is a public consultation process underway. So before discussing the corridors, it is good to, to elaborate a little bit more on the conditions for navigating in this extreme environment, because while it is true that climate change is fundamentally um, transforming the region, the reality is it remains a hazardous navigation environment. So navigation will tend to be restricted to the summer season at this time, perhaps a little bit into the shoulder season, depending on the polar class of the vessels concerned. And uh, navigation will tend to encounter variable and evolving conditions. There may be areas of open waters, but they may also be ice covered areas. And ice is not static, ice, also moves. And where ice is broken, you might have ice flows, and those ice flow might include multi-air ice, which is very hard ice that can cause very serious damage to the hulls of ships. You may have ice packing. And, uh, and indeed, uh, ice forecasting is an essential service in the region. Uh, so there are regular ice charts and bulletins uh, issued during the season. Frequently, passage needs icebreaking assistance. And this is where the Canadian Coast Guard, uh, which has the capability, offers that service. But there are also other vessels in the region that have ice strengthened hulls to enable them to navigate. The weather is very variable. You may have very clear conditions in the summer, but uh, you can also have reduced visibility. You can have a lot of fog uh, on occasions. And you may even have, uh, when there's precipitation, you have potentially ice buildup uh, due to freezing rain, sea spray, and even snow. And for smaller vessels, the ice buildup can cause some really hazardous conditions because if the ice builds heavily on the superstructure, smaller vessels, unless they, um, they are addressing the issue, 
could potentially lose their intact stability. And that is a major safety concern. On top of all of this, we have poor and insufficient charts for most uh, of the region. Barely 10% of Canadian Arctic waters as a whole have been surveyed to modern standards. And uh, we're looking at the same time at areas that are remote. There is little infrastructure to support ships in transit. And uh, the navigation aids will tend to be few and focused in particular area. There are really no ports or repair facilities. Uh, the search and rescue services are limited uh, in the region. And there is very little salvage and pollution response uh, capacity. And we have to remember that these waters and the ice cover are used for Inuit mobility, for temporary camps, hunting, and also by marine animals. So there we have potentially an interface between shipping and Inuit interests and usages that sometimes can be conflictual. Now, the Corridors Initiative, where does this start from? Well, about six years or so ago, there was um, a study made, a preliminary study to understand the patterns of shipping in the Canadian Arctic. And looking at AIS data, uh, the map that is produced there was put together by the Canadian Coast Guard to indicate basically what are the most used uh, routes in Canadian Arctic waters. Now, the map might give you the impression of there is heavy usage, but that is not really the case because this represents every single AIS ping that is then assembled cumulatively for a period of uh, a few years, 2011 to 2013. But this was important because it indicated uh, which are the areas that shipping has tended to favor. So that was a rather important starting point. And when one looks at the data more carefully, one will notice that when you look at those routes that are potentially the future corridors and areas that are not farther than five nautical miles from these areas, you had 77% of the marine traffic in that period, 87.3% uh, of the escorts, you had 73.4% of the marine pollution incidents and 57.5% of the search and rescue incidents. And that area, those um, uh, potential routes uh, account for 96.2% of the navigation aids in the area. Then if we look at the bathymetry and we look, we think in terms of primary, secondary and tertiary corridors, we can see that we actually have more charred data for those particular corridor areas than we have for the Arctic uh, as a whole. But you will note that uh, there is better cover for the Beaufort Sea area than there is for the Eastern Arctic. So for the Eastern Arctic, essentially the point made was that uh, even for those corridors, the charting was really insufficient. So this uh, was the basis to develop a risk assessment framework that takes into consideration the volume of traffic, the probability of uh, groundings because of uncharted areas and so on, the access and uh, potential access to mitigation measures, uh, the width of channel, length and depth, uh, because one has to consider here that some of those channels are actually shallow waters, and then tidal variations. So this uh, assembled together provides a risk assessment uh, uh, matrix. And what this led to was uh, the, uh, the potential uh, uh, idea of having multiple types of corridors. And this is very nicely explained in Chenier et al. Uh, 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 essentially, authors of this particular article were from uh, the Canadian Coast Guard, Transport Canada, and the Hydrographic Service. And they put together basically what they have learned so far on how we might go about designating these corridors. And uh, they suggest that we might have, on a first level, primary corridors, the main corridors, which would be the main traffic highways. And this would, these would, in all likelihood, uh, coincide with the Northwest uh, Passage, at least the principal uh, 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 routes of the Northwest Passage. But uh, that, of course, speaks primarily to transit shipping. The reality is that the Canadian Arctic has different types of shipping. You know, there's very little transit shipping at this time. 
but uh, there is a lot more destination traffic. So essentially traffic from point A to point B, logistics, uh, supplying communities in the north and uh, exporting um, uh, mined resources from the area and, and so on. So with those in mind, um, what we see here is the idea being floated for a system of corridors to address these potential uh, uh, other users. So if we're looking at, uh, for instance, the second level, the secondary corridors, we'll see here uh, essentially corridors aimed for traffic, which has a specific destination or port of call, if you want, in Canadian Arctic waters. Uh, the third level is what would be called the refuge corridor, uh, potentially where ships might need to have temporary haven because of a condition or perhaps bad weather that they might encounter in the interests of uh, maritime safety. And then if you look at the fourth and the fifth, we have private interest and projected corridors, depending on uh, particular resource development or other activities in the Arctic. So essentially, it's a system of corridors to address different functions exercised by shipping in Canadian Arctic waters. And visually, this is what it would look like. So if you look at the solid red, those are the primary uh, corridor areas. And you can see there the main routes of the uh, Northwest Passage, starting with the Beaufort Sea. There are two potential routes to link into Lancaster Sound before, of course, exiting, exiting into the, the Atlantic. And then you can see the colors for the other routes. Now, when these routes uh, were conceptualized, what was taken into consideration here is other activities in the area. And this gives you an example as to what uh, uh, these activities might be. So for instance, these, uh, these green areas here uh, are uh, protected areas in the Arctic. And this green one here, this large one is a very recent one. Uh, it's a national marine conservation area, which is very important for Inuit populations in the area. And what you can see here, the proposal is to designate corridors which go around the protected area. So to, in other words, uh, prevent or minimize a conflict to, to the minimum. And likewise, if you see this protected area over here, you will see that there are corridors that really skirt around it, but not going straight through it. So in a sense, this could be described also as a type of marine spatial planning using uh, potentially in the future kinds of routing measures to be able to move shipping while minimizing its footprint in the area and minimizing the conflicts, especially with indigenous rights and, uh, and environmental concerns. So let's discuss this a bit. So this is essentially the concept of the corridors. So uh, I think the first thing to point out is much of the regulatory framework here is already in place because Canada has a well-developed uh, um, uh, a system of shipping regulation. And the starting point here is that the Polar Code is the new generally accepted international rules and standards dedicated to shipping in Arctic waters um, have been uh, implemented, fully implemented in Canada under the, uh, the Canada Shipping Act 2001 and the Arctic Waters Pollution Prevention Act through a set of common regulations under the two statutes. Uh, we have already the NORDREC reporting system, which has been mandatory since uh, 2010, because obviously the system of traffic will also need a reporting dimension to it. And there, and there is other uh, legislation concerning anything from uh, civil liability to um, um, uh, salvage, abandoned wrecks, and so on, that uh, would also be part of the legal framework for shipping in Arctic waters as it would apply to other uh, Canadian waters. Now, the most interesting thing I find about the corridors is that they will be accessible to shipping without charge. So this is interesting. There will not be a charge for transiting uh, through these uh, corridors. And indeed, the purpose here is to make sure that the service and the limit resources available will be focused on those corridors. So essentially, once these corridors are designated, or, um, what we'll see is greater focus of efforts for charting, for instance, um, uh, deployment and maintenance of navigation aids, provision of ice breaking services, 
And the purpose would be here really to incentivize shipping to use the corridors rather than navigate in other Arctic waters. So, uh, so this is important because this is a way of incentivizing shipping while at the same time minimizing footprints, the footprint of shipping in the fragile Arctic. And then uh, the other important thing to point out too is that this could potentially have an impact purely on a market basis on marine insurance because uh, we can expect here insurers to step in and say, look, now that you have uh, services and safer, um, uh, uh, for safer shipping in Arctic waters, um, the assureds will, can be expected to use those corridors as the definition of the trading limit for their purposes of the mar their marine uh, insurance policy. And indeed, uh, insurers don't like it when uh, uh, the assureds uh, uh, um, breach the warranty of the trading limit. So the trading limit will designate where the ship can actually uh, operate. So that could be a, a beneficial market influence for the use of these corridors. So there are some things that are still unclear in terms of structure, for instance, what would be the structure to administer these corridors? Because Canada does not have the equivalent of the Northern Sea Route administration that the Russian Federation has. One possibility would be, would NORDREC itself be perhaps built further? At the moment, it's the Arctic Marine Traffic System focusing primarily on reporting and provision of information and so on. Or would Transport Canada, because Transport Canada is leading the collaborative governance project, would they perhaps be the lead agency? Or would there be an interagency coordinating body? Because, for example, Transport and the Canadian Coast Guard actually have overlapping mandates with respect to navigation aids. Uh, or could it be perhaps a different model? Some people in the literature have suggested that the St. Lawrence Seaway Commission could be an interesting model here and potentially involving federal, territorial, indigenous, and other stakeholder representation. But in any case, one thing which is unclear at this time is what will be the relationship between the corridors and the current shipping safety control zones that you see on the map. At the moment, those zones are important. Perhaps they're in a state of transition because now with the polar code, what we see is greater emphasis on using the Polaris uh, system for risk assessment rather than the combined time zone uh, uh, system that Canada has. So Canada is in the process of phasing out the time zone uh, system. There are some uns unanswered questions with respect to process. Um, certainly there will be collaborative governance involving in, in indigenous uh, peoples and other stakeholders, but it is unclear as to how this will actually work. Um, Reconciliation, as I mentioned right at the outset, will be uh, factored in here. That is the lens through which this governance model will have to be built. And, uh, and also, uh, how will the process of designating uh, corridors and routing measures uh, uh, actually take place? And will there be an interface with the IMO, given that the IMO is the organization, the international organization responsible for designating routing measures. But we have to bear in mind that these routing measures will be in what Canada considers are internal waters. And then there's the question how information on the corridors uh, will be communicated to, um, to industry, whether it will be through notices to mariners, notices to shipping. Will charts be annotated, uh, for instance, um, will the IMO be notified on their SOLAS, uh, for instance? And, uh, and then there's also a role for the Arctic Council. Would Canada, for instance, notify Arctic uh, states of these corridors um, through the Arctic Shipping Best Practices Forum? There is already you know, notice in a sense, uh, because Arctic Council has been informed, but the details have uh, yet to be, to be developed. So let me conclude here because I realize that I'm going over my time. Um, I think one way to look at the corridors really is as a pragmatic, equitable, and reasonable approach to the contemporary of to the contemporary governance of shipping in uh, Canadian Arctic waters. It, it will enable shipping, which is important here, but minimizes the environmental footprint and respecting at the same time indigenous rights. And on the indigenous rights aspect, I think it's very important, especially for those in the audience um, who have a law of the sea background or a maritime law background, that we often do not think in terms of how 
uh, our legal regimes, the law of the sea and maritime law interface with other areas of international law, in particular human rights law and indigenous law. So there is an interface, there is a relationship there. So we have to bear in mind that the indigenous peoples enjoy rights at customary international law to their lands, territories, and resources. And uh, therefore users of the marine environment have to respect also those rights at international law. And finally, I will conclude with the point that uh, this approach, uh, which is being pursued at this time by Canada, uh, in my view, as I, as I understand it, appears unlikely to cause diplomatic concerns because of the voluntary nature. Uh, shipping will not be charged for the use of these corridors and the accessibility of the corridors while at the same time enhancing maritime safety. And I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Aldo, for that stimulating discussion and a great introduction to the theme of, of this, morning's, um, speak, uh, this morning's session. Our next speaker is um, Dr. Hong Nong, well known to me, uh, holds a PhD from the University of Alberta, my university. She is concurrently a research fellow with the Chinese Institute at the University of Alberta, the National Institute for South China She Studies, and is executive director of the Institute of China America Studies in Washington. Her most recent book is China's Role in the Arctic, Observing and Being Observed. The floor is yours, please, Noel. Well, thank you very much, Gordon, for your very kind introduction. As you said, I wish I were in Sanya right now, uh, in person. Um, good, uh, good morning to my colleagues and friends in, in Sanya and also to those online. Let me share my screen. So I was speaking on the uh, I was speaking on the non-Arctic states' role in the Arctic. So explaining how these Asian countries observing what's happening in terms of the Arctic Ocean governance and how their policy and also the activity is being interpreted or being observed by other uh, uh, important Arctic stakeholders. I will start uh, by explaining a few Asian countries who have similar interests and also policy in the Arctic, and then moving on to a specific study on Chinese policy on the Arctic. And then also moving on to discuss why I think the cooperation among the Arctic states and also between the Arctic and non-Arctic states are very important in pursuing many of the important ocean government practices in this region. And then finally, I'm going to look at how the US and China engage with each other uh, in the outer region. So let me start with the, uh, explaining Japan, South Korea, China, India, and also Singapore. They were all granted observer status in the Arctic Council in May 2013. So when I look at their policy, for instance, Japan, it has uh, in early stage footprints in the Arctic, but its uh, approach well, has been developed from in the very beginning. They're more focused on independent research project without too much engagement from the government. And then particularly after uh, 2013 has gone through a tremendous transformation from involvement to more and more engagement from the government and also developing a strategy on the Arctic. The South Korea, I think it took the opportunity to become an observing Arctic Council as a, a very good opportunity to develop a strategy for commercial exploitation of the Arctic while continuing its already ongoing research activity in this region. Uh, looking at Chinese Arctic policy, I think it's very simply to put it this way, it has been keen to participate in the Arctic governance through working closely with the Arctic littoral states and Arctic council states and also other non-Arctic countries. To look at India's uh, Arctic uh, attention, we will consider because India has not uh, issued a formal white paper or strategy on the Arctic, but it will be considered as a following or continuation of its ongoing uh, efforts on um, scientific research and technical cooperation in the polar region, which is studied by in 1951. 
And Singapore is an interesting case because there are two different perceptions about whether it's a competitive, uh, it's a competition with the opening up of the Northern Sea Route and also Northwest Patch in, in the Arctic, whether it's pose a competition for Singapore as a, a, a commercial shipping port, or it will also create other economic opportunity in terms of being more engaged in economic development and also international cooperation. So I can see that well, I can see that China, Japan, and South Korea they have more similarity or common or converge of interest in in the Arctic. Uh, they want they would like to participate more in many of the international cooperation regimes in order to have the voice heard and have their speaking rights heard. So in order to in order to do that, when I look at the practice of these three countries, they're more involved in Arctic affairs in international level through, for instance, the ninety. Uh, Love Sea Convention, also United Nations Framework on Climate Change Conference, and also through many of international treaties developed by international maritime organization. And there are another level that also involved in the multilateral bilateral agreements, such as Arctic Council, Arctic Economic Council, and also uh, bilateral agreement between the countries, for instance, between China and Norway, between Japan and Norway, for instance. And then uh, the three country has been also very actively in uh, initiating a lot of trilateral cooperation on the Arctic issues. So the Asian Forum for Polar Science is a very good example to show that how the three countries have been working together for this initiative, which has become uh, the only one regional research organization. And then when I look at the, the, they share a lot of interest in terms of uh, strengthening expectation and also enhancing international cooperation in terms of science and technology. However, when we look at the different motivation of the three countries there, we also see invitable competition among the three. That's why it's also very important to strengthen the RT affairs cooperation among the three Northeast Asian countries. Let me move on to China's case. I think China's release of its uh, China Arctic Policy Wiper in 2018, it's well received and also the document is very well articulated and well received by many of the Arctic stakeholders. So to uh, understand many of the Chinese ongoing activities, I think it's very important to understand Chinese policy goal in Arctic, which are shaped in four key words to understand, to protect, to develop and also to participate in the governance of the Arctic. So in order to realize these policy goals, the white paper emphasized the basic principle to respect and to enhance cooperation to achieve a win result and also look at sustainable development. So when I look at, I got to mention about, uh, as I also mentioned in my in introductory uh, slides, I want to observe, I want to explain Chinese activity in this region by saying it's observing and it's also being observed. So there are many ways to look at Chinese policy and also practices in terms of its contribution or participation in ocean governance in the Arctic. One is through to look at its, uh, China and its engagement in international institutions such as Arctic Council, Arctic Economic Council, and also Arctic Regional uh, Technology Com Commission. And then also look at Chinese uh, role in, and also how it's viewed international pra law practice in this region. So China is uh, yeah, two very important international law, Loves Convention and also 1925 uh, Spitzberg uh, Treaty, which China has already uh, ratified. And then the third or a very most recent uh, part is, the, is um, the agreement to prevent unregulated fishing, high seas fishing in the Central Arctic Ocean, which China is one of the very first 10 countries are involved in a negotiation process. And there's also very important to look at Chinese partnership with the artist stakeholders. Well, when I say artist stakeholders, I'm looking at both uh, the five little artist states and also the three Nordic states like Finland, Iceland, and also um, Switzerland. And also to look at Chinese partnership 
we're entering the Russian with the indigenous people group and also non artist state, as I just mentioned, like uh, Japan and South Korea. And then it's also very important to look at Chinese practices through the sectoral engagement to look at its shipping and how it in, uh, interrupt with the literal states in terms of a shipping industry and also research development industry. And certainly it's very important to look at how China has been working very closely with many of the literal states to enhance scientific research in these regions. However, uh, if, even though there was a lot of very positive uh, feedback or uh, to understand Chinese art policy white, uh, white paper, there was also some not that friendly or not where we see perception about Chinese uh, activity or presence in the Arctic. For instance, when China used polar silk road into white Arctic paper, it's not well uh, understood or well received by other some countries. I'm going to explain later. And there are certainly they look at China's engagement in many of the infrastructural construction as a death trap. There's uh, also a very negative uh, perception about Chinese uh, presence in, in, in this region. So that will explain why for some artist states, particularly some leader states, on the one hand, they see opportunity with uh, countries like Japan, China, South Korea. It's a very good opportunity to enhance the local uh, infrastructure and also economy because they do need investment for these countries. But on the other hand, they also can see the with more and more presence of these non artist states in, in, in the other region, they will consider it as a challenge to, they don't want these countries to have more influence in terms of decision making and in terms of many of the issue uh, in this region, in terms of governance in this region. So uh, moving on, I'm going to uh, show a slide how I see when Chinese narrative integrated with Western discourse by looking into these five uh, literal state Arctic, uh, how they view Chinese and also other countries present in this region. Uh, starting from Russia, I think Russia's attitude, it appears more uh, ambivalent on Chinese art interests. On the one hand, art is a security national identity for Russia, but on the other hand, you do need a lot of support and army growth, more and more dependent on exploitation of its art resources, and we do need more investment from non art states. In Canada, we have two Canadian uh, friends sitting in this panel. So for Canada, I think that Chinese art policy is important, but also very important because it does not say anything about the legal state of the Northwest Passage, but it does mention very clearly that when China's company uh, is involved, when it's involved in shipping or energy development in this, in this uh, Arctic, it's very important to respect the national uh, domestic legislation for all these later states. For Norway, I think uh, Norway considers the Chinese inclusion as a great opportunity and also a way of development new strong economic partnership. So that might also a very interesting, interesting case. So it's a mix of different reaction, particularly in when in the Trump administration's uh, period and then the um, the Greenland the airport issue has also become a very key issue between China and Denmark, and also between China and US in the Arctic. And moving to the United States, I'm going to leave that slide later by saying very quickly, quickly go through when I say, well, there was very important to enhance cooperation among non arty states, but it's also very important to also pursue the cooperation between Arctic and the non arty states, for instance, to rec uh, re recognize and respect each other's rights, which will uh, constitute the legal basis cooperation between Arctic and non arctic states, and also the mutual understanding and the trust will provide a political guarantee for cooperation. And, and certainly uh, the common interest on pursuing joint research will present a major field of cooperation. Uh, my uh, last few slides will focus on how the US and China relations uh, has been developed in the other region. It's very important. We look, we will look at the, the these two countries, one representing the literal state, the other representing a non arty state. So, so the US, for instance, has its uh, member state of the Council, while China is only observer state in the Arctic Council. 
And then um, both of them ratified or signed the uh, Spitzberg Treaty, one in 24, one in 25. And then the US and has been developing other region policy from looking at its uh, document in 2009, 2013, and most recent one in 2019, when China articulates uh, policy wide plan in 2018. So they do have their international or national uh, framework to articulate their interest in these regions. So the US uh, RT policy, it, I think it's very similar uh, with uh, other literal states and the national security identity and also protecting the art environment, conserving its living resources is very common among all the other states. But I also want to emphasize, I think, when why the U.S. has an interesting um, perspective on non-artist states uh, interest in this region, because they're looking more, it's welcoming more institutional cooperation among the eight artist states like US, Canada, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Russia, and Sweden. They're all as the member of the Council, they are looking, so there are two different priorities of looking at cooperation from the US perspective. They welcome more cooperation from these regions. Uh, and then, my next slide. A, a, a few words about the US view on Chinese anti policy. So from the Obama administration, they are very keen on climate change uh, initiative. And then moving to Trump administration, I think there's a lot of gap left behind because it don't play the role, important role of climate change. So when moving to Biden administration, I think it's, it's very eager to bridge the gap a leadership role and uh, how to uh, come to effect climate change in the Arctic and also in the Antarctica. So the possibility for to adapt the new environment. And that is why I think in September there is a a call from the Department of State, which uh, reactivated its art executive steering committee and also the US Art Research Commission. Many of the well known US scholars working on the art has been appointed to serve in these two committees. That's why we failed to get uh, some American scholars in, in this panel because they're now moving to serve in these two very important uh, mechanisms. And they're also concerned about trying to increasing uh, cooperation with Russia or would be, uh, has been consider for the U.S. as um, a big concern and they don't want, don't want the U.S. and uh, they don't want China and Russia cooperation to dominate the Asian governance uh, agenda. And the U.S. also calling for continuing U.S. leadership role in the other issues because compared with Canada, Russia, I think the U.S. has played quite a low profile in, in the Arctic compared with other major leader states. So it's trying to catch up. And in order to do that, it also strengthen, emphasize it needs to strengthen its operational capacity in the Arctic, including increasing the budget of the Coast Guard. So, and there was a different voice than to look at more rational on how the U.S. view Chinese engagement in the Arctic. For instance, there was a uh, there was a perception saying uh, Chinese emergence as, as a growing science actor in the Arctic should be welcome, but the scientific activities and research station must be more uh, integrated into a broader international cooperation efforts rather than bilateral efforts. And also it's in, very important that the US will, uh, should understand the totality of China's vision in order to uh, make a right assessment on how it impacts the U.S. other interests, as well as the future development of Arctic governance and institutions. So when I look at, because Alaska, there's a lot of ongoing work between China and Alaska, because Alaska is the, the state that makes the U.S. become a leader state for Arctic. I'm going to, uh, uh, to skip this one. Uh, so Certainly there's a lot of convergence when I try to understand the US and China's other policy. They have a convergent interest in terms of its other environment and size, in terms of both of shipping uh, theories through the uh, high north. And they're all in, uh, actually involved in development of polar code. And also that they both are out of uh, side fishery management agreement in the central Arctic Ocean. So, and their divergence of interest is more or less on how they view each other's relations with the Arctic states. For instance, US may not be very comfortable seeing more and more engagement between China and Russia 
and then with and China and other Nordic countries, increasing cooperation on scientific research would be considered as also another threat for the U.S. And certainly the U.S.-China relations in general, it's something that always sit uh, as a uh, step behind, sit between uh, to further uh, pursuing the U.S.-China cooperation on the Arctic. So the future cooperation between the two countries, I identify a few areas, for instance, the science, talent, climate change, infrastructure, and also sustainable access to energy resource, and also indigenous people's interests would be something that the two countries may have interest in further cooperation. Uh, with that, I will uh, conclude my presentation. I'm looking forward to discussion later on. Thank you very much, uh, Nong. That was most helpful in framing that set of issues and uh, relevant directly to the question of governance. I'd like now to introduce uh, Suzanne Lalonde, Professor of International Public International Law and Law of the Sea, at the Law Faculty at the Université de Montréal. She holds a PhD in Public International Law from the University of Cambridge. And Suzanne is a member of the Canadian Arctic Security Working Group, the Transatlantic Marine Maritime Emissions Research Network, the Multidisciplinary Canadian Arctic Shipping and Transportation Research Network, and the North American Arctic Defense and Security Network. Suzanne, uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much. I will, um, good morning and good evening to all. I'd like to thank the organizers of the symposium and the conveners of this session on the Arctic I'm very honored to be participating in such an important meeting. Now I will try to share my screen as well as my colleagues. Um, <clears throat> not so much. Um, if you type in, uh, you access the Arctic Council's website on the internet, um, of course, you will find a vast amount of very valuable information. And on the first page, um, under the title, Our Work, six themes are organized. And if you click on those themes, you get more information on the Council's projects and initiatives. One of those six themes is simply titled The Ocean. And if you click on the ocean, the principal web page uh, has a beautiful picture of Arctic sea ice and the large title in bold, Cooperation for a Sustainable Arctic Ocean. One of the introductory paragraphs on that first page explains that to protect the Arctic marine environment, the Arctic states have recognized the need to work closely together. And of course, it goes on to say that they do cooperate on a, a multitude of uh, issues, of maritime issues, including on marine pollution, uh, sustainable shipping practices, as we've heard, search and rescue operations, and many more. I believe that the North American Arctic is an important example of this kind of effective collaboration. In this case, of bilateral cooperation between Canada and the United States. And I wanted to use my few minutes to focus on this particular collaborative relationship because it exists despite there being some sensitive disagreements between Canada and the United States in the Arctic region. For example, a disagreement uh, exists as to the maritime boundary between the two neighbors in the Beaufort Sea. And perhaps the most sensitive disagreement concerns the status of the Northwest Passage. There can be no denying, it's well documented, oft repeated, that there is a long-standing disagreement, um, or perhaps kind more, more softly, a difference of opinion um, between Canada and the United States in regards to the legal status of the Northwest Passage in the Canadian Arctic Archipelago. This slide identifies different routes through the archipelago. And as we've heard from all those uh, wonderful presentation, only three are generally considered as being practical for routine maritime traffic. And you know, we're going to try and, and coax ships to, to take certain routes. 
of course, um, climate change and the melting of the sea ice, have we, have we've, as we've heard, have made the routes of the Northwest Passage more accessible and um, have ensured that the issue of the Northwest Passage remains extremely topical. Um, this is just a contrast, uh, the Manhattan struggling to transit the Northwest Passage in 1969 in very difficult conditions and a photograph of the Admonson Canada's research uh, vessel uh, shared with the Canadian Coast Guard uh, having a much easier time in this in this particular section of the Northwest Passage uh, in 2017. Um, sorry. Um, Canada claims that all of the waters uh, within the archipelago are historic internal waters subject to its sovereignty. And in the 1993 land claims, uh, Nunavut Land Claims Agreement, the agreement, the historic agreement that created the territory of Nunavut, Canada recognized that its sovereignty is supported and indeed is founded on Inuit use and occupancy. Most of the Northwest Passage is in the territory of Nunavut, and it is an Inuit homeland, as Aldo so eloquently explained. Inuit have hunted, fished, traveled and lived on the Northwest Passage for millennia. And the 1993 Land Claims Agreement acknowledges this ancient connection between the Inuit and the Arctic waters and recognizes that the people of Nunavut have the right to be involved in decisions about how those Arctic waters are to be managed, developed and protected. Washington has long considered, however, that the roots of the Northwest Passage constitute an international strait, subject to a right of transit passage under the law of the sea. As you can see, the Canadian and the American positions could not be further apart. Sovereign internal waters, international strait with freedom of navigation, well, right of transit passage. However, I'm heartened by words of wisdom um, pronounced by President uh, Kennedy when in 1961, 60 years ago, 60 years ago, when he addressed the Canadian Parliament um, uh, in Ottawa, his speech has been described as a masterpiece of balance and grace that captured the essence of the relationship between Canada and the United States. The quote to the right of the photograph is the best known. Geography has made us neighbors, history has made us friends, Economics has made us partners and necessity has made us allies. But I'm more interested in what President Kennedy said next. We are allies, he stated. This is a partnership, not an empire. We are bound to have differences and disappointments. And we are equally bound to bring them out into the open, to settle them where they can be settled, and to respect each other's views when they cannot be settled. I believe President Kennedy's insistence on respect for each other's views is an essential ingredient for any meaningful cooperation. And it has been the cornerstone of Canada and US collaborative efforts in the Arctic over the course of many decades. I included this image of the Canadian Arctic archipelago with Europe superimposed upon it to emphasize that cooperation in the vast North American Arctic is a necessity for Canada, I would, I would say, but also for the US. The establishment of NORAD in 1957, a binational centralized air and eventually maritime defense command is compelling evidence of mutual trust and respect. Of course, I acknowledge that this type of institution is far beyond what may always be needed to cooperate successfully for sustainable ocean governance. But I wanted to quote the third preambular paragraph of the NORAD agreement, which was renewed in 2006, because I was, I was struck by the wording in that paragraph. Both Canada, as you can see, and the United States attest to their conviction, they're convinced that cooperation uh, is a proven and flexible means to pursue shared goals and interests, that it remains vital to their mutual security 
but also for me, quite significantly, that it is compatible with their national interests. Collaboration is thus recognized not only as a valuable and efficient means to achieve shared objectives, shared goals, but it's also recognized as a powerful mechanism for the advancement of national interests. Another telling example of uh, President Kennedy's um, respectful understanding is the 1988 Canada-US Agreement on Cooperation. It is widely understood, at least widely understood in Canada, that if an agreement was eventually reached on these dif difficult uh, questions, it was thanks to the close relationship between President Reagan and Prime Minister Mulroney. But more importantly, again, according to Canadian legend, that it was thanks to President Reagan's deep understanding of the political sensitivity of the Northwest Passage issue on the Canadian side and his remarkable determination to find a way forward. Thanks to the ingenuity of lawyers at the State Department and Canadian Foreign Affairs, the agreement, as you can see in paragraph three, provides that U.S. icebreakers proposing to engage in research while transiting through the Northwest Passage will ask the Canadian government for permission to do so, and that Canada will, of course, give its consent. Yes, this arrangement, of course, is entirely consistent with the regime governing marine scientific research uh, under the Law of the Sea Convention and under general international law. And yet, what an incredibly elegant way out of the impasse. In addition, Article 4 of the 1988 agreement explicitly states that nothing in the agreement can prejudice either party's legal position. There is therefore no concession, no dilution of Washington's legal position and wider freedom of seas policy, while I would suggest reaping the benefits of leaving the waters under the control of its NORAD partner. This is just one example of how Canada and the United States have found ways to set aside their legal difference and get on with the business of resolving issues of mutual interest and concerns. And this collaboration in regards to the marine Arctic uh, occurs at multiple level and time only permits a few examples. <clears throat> Last summer, the largest icebreaker in the US Coast Guard fleet, the Healy, transited through the Northwest Passage. In making the announcement during his State of the Coast Guard address in March of 2021, Admiral Schultz made a point of emphasizing that the mission was being planned along with Global Affairs Canada. Of course, the Healy's trip again fell under, was under the 1988 uh, Arctic Cooperation Agreement, which I've just mentioned. As it was always intended, it would have 20 scientists on board and they would be conducting scientific marine research, which they did. And so it was the, the agreement covered the Healy's trip. And so, but I was, I, I, I'm in complete agreement with uh, Professor Buffard's uh, comments and interpretation. He is a professor at the University of Fairbanks in Alaska, in Alaska because he insisted that Admiral Schultz's comments were significant nonetheless, because it sent a clear message. And that message was that the official status of the Northwest Passage is less important than being able to collaborate and operate with expectation and confidence with close partners. Um, the Healy's transit was a tremendously valuable opportunity. It was a joint research and educational collaboration at a time when conditions in the Northwest Passage and indeed in the Arctic region generally are changing dramatically. During its transit, the Healy collected a lot of valuable data, including bathymetric data which will be shared with, on the US side, NOAA's um, Office of Coastal Survey, but also shared with the Canadian Hydrographic Service and even the Danish Geodata Agency. The Canadian Coast Guard and the Canadian Rangers also partnered with the Healy um, near Resolute Bay in the eastern side of the archipelago in early September for a joint search and rescue exercise. In the photograph on the bottom left, 
an air crew aboard a Canadian Coast Guard helicopter is preparing to land aboard the Healy during this joint search and rescue exercise. And the men talking in the bottom right corner are Canadian Coast Guard Commissioner Mario Pelletier, Canadian Coast Guard Assistant Commissioner for the Arctic, Neil O'Rourke, and the Healy's commanding officer, Captain Ken Bode. I should add that planning and executing the Healy's transit this summer was greatly facilitated thanks to the relationships that have been established through the annual summits held between the Canadian and the American Coast Guards. The annual summits are intended to foster and they do foster communication and cooperation at the senior operational and regional levels in both organizations. As for the picture in the top right corner, Every year, Canadian Armed Forces conduct Operation Nanook. It is their signature northern operation, and it is comprised of different uh, distinct activities. This uh, past summer, in the context of Op Nanook 2021, Canada's Goose Bay, a Kingston-class coastal defense vessel, and the Harry de Wolf, the first of Canada's new Arctic offshore patrol vessels, conducted joint maritime exercises with the U.S. Coast Guard cutters Escanada, Escanaba and Richard Snyder. In the Tajitit phase of Op Nanook, the Escanaba and Richard Snyder participated in a mass casualty, a maritime incident with mass casualties and mass pollution exercise along the shores of Baffin Island. The crews of, the both, of both American vessels supported the Royal Canadian Navy in a series of rescue and assistance procedures. U.S. participation in op uh, operations like Nanook is seen as critical, as it is widely acknowledged, and not just on the Canadian side, that in such a disastrous scenario, mass casualties, a terrible uh, pollution incident in the far north, Support from neighbors and allies will, will definitely be, you know, will in all likelihood be needed. Of course, such exercises build trust and, and cooperation, of course, and they're helping to ensure that both countries are ready uh, and responsive to the ever changing maritime environment of the Arctic. At the opposite end of state to state cooperation, Northern communities are also collaborating. The Alaskan Arctic Waterways Safety Committee um, was established in October of 2014 as a self-governing multi-stakeholder group focused on improving communications, mapping, and marine policies. And it is, its aim is to promote maritime safety, protect the marine environment, and also preserve the lifestyles of those who live in the Arctic. The uh, committee is fascinating, is made up a wide array of Arctic maritime users and stakeholders. It includes subsistence hunters, local and tribal governments, advocacy groups, and even industry representatives. There's uh, people from offshore oil and gas developers, tug and barge operators. And thanks to federal funding, the community meant some community members from Cambridge Bay a small hamlet of 1,400 inhabitants that's pointed out on the map on the southeast coast of Victoria Island and right on the shores of the Northwest Passage were able to travel to Alaska to learn, to learn from the Alaskan Arctic Waterway Safety Committee. And the result of this engagement was the creation of the Victoria Island Waterway Safety Committee. Another and my final example of local more local collaboration has to do with the Alaskan Marine Exchange. It has been instrumental in the establishment of a wonderful program, the Inuit Marine Monitoring Program in Nunavut, a program that couples experienced Inuit hunters as marine monitors with real-time vessel tracking technology. The Alaskan Marine Exchange has supplied many of the terrestrial automatic uh, um, identification systems deployed across Nunavut and has also helped in training the Inuit monitors. And there are many other examples of maritime cooperation between Canada and the US and the Arctic. In concluding, I would just like to emphasize that it is because the Canada-US relationship 
of trust and respect is well established. That meaningful cooperation has withstood the vagaries of political personalities and specific agendas. Irrespective of sensitive legal differences, the recognition that collaboration and cooperation serves the interests of both states and jurors. And I would suggest that climate change and its cascade of consequences for the Arctic region have only confirmed the necessity for such strong partnerships. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, we are slipping a little bit behind, so I would ask uh, our last two speakers to ensure they attempt to stay within the 15 minute limit. Um, I'd now like to introduce um, Bai Jiayu, professor and doctoral supervisor of the School of Law at Nankai University. Um, she is a visiting professor at Dalhousie University um, and, and a visiting scholar at the George Washington University. Her publications include several books whose titles are, include Legal Research About Arctic Shipping Research, Legal Regulations About Ballast Water, and Research on the Marine Invasion of Alien Species, Legal Prevention and Control. Please, um, Jayu, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you for introduction. Okay. Uh, good morning and a good uh, good evening to our colleagues online. It is my great honor to be invited to attend this symposium on the global maritime governance and the ocean governance. And I'm very happy to meet with the old friends online, uh, Gordon, Eldo, Susan, and uh, Hono. And today, the topic I share is the cooperation about Arctic affairs among China, Japan, and the Republic of Korea Review and the Prospect. So first, I will briefly introduce the current changing Arctic and then summarize the attitudes towards the rule of law in Arctic governance reflected of the, those three states' uh, policies and how they could realize their goal uh, of their Arctic policy through the multi-level platforms. And then I will come the characteristics of those uh, states' Arctic practice respectively and collectively. And then finally, look ahead to the future cooperation of those states in the Arctic. So first, I will have a quick look <clears throat> at the changing Arctic. Uh, according to the study of the scholars, the major reduction in Arctic sea ice extent in the recent years, summers is an, uh, is an important factor for the erosion of the uh, Arctic coast. And from the right graph, we may notice that the Arctic sea and ice are continuously melting. And uh, the lost uh, extent of the Arctic is equivalent to about twice the size of the Alaska. And at the meantime, there is correlation between the Arctic oscillation and the average frequency of extreme precipitation events over the century southern China. And also the negative Arctic oscillation will uh, have caused Japan to suffer abnormally cold season in winter. And also South, South Korea have, have experienced extreme cold weather, which is closely related to the loss of the Arctic sea ice, which means that the uh, changing Arctic actually also influences the states beyond the Arctic region. And according to special report on ocean and crossfire in a changing climate pressed in 2019, the issue of climate change is difficult to be resolved by individual countries alone. And what is needed is collective action and international cooperation. So it is necessary for other stakeholders to participate in Arctic governance. Then how to guarantee and support the proper participation of those stakeholders we could take China, South Korea, and Japan, for example, and clarify the importance of the rule of law for the, uh, to regulate their uh, participation in Arctic governance. And for China's Arctic policy, actually, uh, Hono has made a very comprehensive uh, introduction about Arctic China's Arctic policy, and uh, I will briefly introduce here. So China uh, actually emphasized that 
the activities in Arctic should accord with the international laws, including the UN Charter and close the general international laws and the other uh, international laws, such as the uh, AMO Polar Code and the, uh, the UNFCCC and Paris Agreement, and also some other regional agreements made on the platform of Arctic Council at the regional level and also some other bilateral and multilateral arrangements and agreements like the CAO fisher uh, agreements. And also Japan also stresses the importance to ensure the rule of law and also uh, lists some uh, international laws as the anclos and the principles of the international laws. And the Korea's uh, Arctic plan also relates to the uh, international laws at the relevant levels, the same as China. So here we can notice that ANCLOS provide a basic framework for both Arctic, uh, for both Arctic coastal states surrounding the Arctic Ocean and non-Arctic states for the Arctic Ocean affairs. And also the AMO provides the polar code as the uh, framework norms for the navigation in the Arctic region. The Spitsbergen Treaty regulates both Norway and other member states, the rights and obligations in Svarba. Uh, after the completion by China of the uh, CAO fishery agreement this year, this agreement has already came into force since June 25th, 2021, and it will regulate the rights and obligations for the member states in the Central Arctic Ocean. Then, Based on those international laws, how the states could uh, participate in the Arctic governance through the relevant multilateral platforms? Well, the Chinese President Xi Jinping and the Special Representative of Arctic Affairs, Mr. Gaofeng, have both expressed China's uh, intention to exert and exert importance to cooperate with the international organizations related with the Arctic. Uh, for example, at the global level, the organizations, sub-organizations under the UN and the regional, at regional level, Arctic Council and some other uh, multilateral arrangements like among uh, Korea, China, and Japan. And also we could notice that uh, both Korea and Japan have uh, looked forward and respects the cooperation with the relevant multilateral organizations. So we could notice that there are similarities among the three states for the uh, platforms uh, to uh, engage in the Arctic affairs. They, all of them welcome the multilevel organizations and uh, it reflects their adherence to participate in the Arctic governance within the framework of multilateralism. For example, we could uh, uh, point out in detail that uh, the IPCC will provide the very important platform for those three states to encounter with the climate change issues related to the Arctic. And UNEP will uh, provide opportunity and platform for the uh, environment protection issues and MO actually provides a opportunity for those states to play a role in the, um, on the MO uh, and uh, involved in the Arctic navigation uh, rules formation. And also as the most influential regional organization, Arctic Council has provided indirect opportunity for these uh, Nordic states as the stakeholder and observer states to involve in the participation. The Arctic Circle Forum under the Arctic Circle is actually already held several times by China, Japan, and Korea in recent years. And China, Japan, and Korea actually has their own Arctic Forum uh, in the Arctic Affairs, and four sessions have been held by those states, and some results have been achieved on the uh, scientific research field and other fields. And also the non-governmental organizations also could provide opportunities like ISC and the Asian Forum to the polar sciences provide the opportunities to conduct the scientific research cooperation. 
So based on these uh, international laws and multi-level uh, organizations, what are the characteristics of those states' practice in the Arctic? Well, for China, it uh, intends to be an active participant, participator, builder, and a contributor for the Arctic uh, governance. And actually, China has a long history for engaging in the Arctic uh, affairs. And uh, it has developed the affairs into several fields, including the scientific research, ecologic environment protection, climate change response, economic development, and cultural exchanges, etc. And also, uh, Japan has identified itself as, a, uh, and it believes that it has an extended polar identity, and has uh, uh, and has also developed its uh, own Arctic policy, uh, actively involved in the formation of CAO uh, fishery agreement. Uh, for Korea, it has believed that it has the responsibilities rights and obligations for the Arctic issues. And uh, also Korea has developed some trade agreements with the Arctic states and actively uh, participate in the ammo, on the AMO platform for the formation of some navigation rules in the Arctic. So we could notice that all these three states have some certain interests in the Arctic and uh, the believe that and they share the common identity of as the Arctic stakeholders. And uh, they actually have a long history of engaging in the uh, Arctic affairs. And uh, they all uh, be granted the observer states in the same year in the Arctic Council. And uh, they all participate in the Arctic governance according to the relevant international rules and on the platforms of the international organizations. So uh, actually besides those practices respectively, they have conducted some cooperation together for the Arctic governments. And in 2017, they have uh, emphasized to conduct a joint study to assess the pollution and climate impacts in the Arctic. And uh, actually it is reported that those three states have used to uh, provide the equipment for the Arctic scientific research. And also there is indeed a platform for the three states and uh, some consensus on joint response to climate change and scientific research, a scientific investigation of Arctic region have been made. Um, but uh, uh, we have to notice that the cooperation and the platform is still waiting to be strengthened and restarted. And uh, actually there is still greater potential uh, for the cooperation among the three states. For example, they could continuously promote the Arctic Climate Response Cooperation and extend the cooperation on the CAO Fisher Agreement and make good use of the scientific and technological advantages to make joint contribution to Arctic green shipping. So the uh, prospective development of the cooperation among those, among those states, three states actually has provided the opportunities to practice in a cooperative, in those cooperative potentials. Uh, the leaders of the three states actually have made commitments to the climate change, which is uh, also a main issue for the Arctic. So the three states could work together to establish a joint market to accelerate the shift away from the fossil fuel. And also uh, we need to, we, we may notice that uh, all the three states are members of the CAO fishery agreement. So they could, uh, strengthen the communication on the monitoring plan and uh, formulate the temporary conservative measures. And also after the uh, this year, MOC, MEPC have uh, adopted the resolution on the banning of the use of the heavy fuel oil. So the three states could strengthen the exchange of the, on the sustainable Arctic navigation. <laughs> So uh, to summarize and to conclude, 
we can notice that Arctic governance cannot be separated from the joint efforts of both Arctic states and other Arctic stakeholders and the corporate cooperative agree, uh, engagement of the three states is based on the rule of law in the Arctic through multi-level international platforms. The cooperation among the three states is not only conducive to the realization of their interests in the Arctic, but also could contribute to the Arctic governments through the collective wisdom and efforts. So we are really looking forward to the ending of the pandemic as soon as possible and resuming and accelerating the diplomatic process delayed by the pandemic for the cooperation. Okay, here's all my presentation and thank you for attention. Thank you, um, Dr. Pai. And I, I can assume, I think that everyone in that room and online is welcoming also, will would welcome the ending of the pandemic. Uh, we now turn to Dr. Sakiko Hataya, uh, who is research fellow at the Ocean Policy Research Institute of the Saskawa Peace Foundation. Dr. Hataya's research is centered on the law of international organizations and polar law. And in particular, Dr. Hataya has studied the functioning of the Arctic Council. Uh, the floor is yours, please, Dr. Hataya. Thank you very much for the introduction and hi, hello everyone. I'm glad to be here today. I'm Sakiko Hataya, a research fellow at the Ocean Policy Research Institute, Sasakawa Peace Foundation, Japan. The title of the presentation today is the opportunity and challenge of the Northern Sea Route after the Suez obstruction of 2021. I will show the screen. Okay. So the shocking news made the headline worldwide from March 23rd, 20, 2021 this year. The 400 meter, the giant container ever given obstruct, obstructed the Suez Canal at six kilometers north from its southern entrance. Well, this picture shows that the circumstances of the ever given obstructions. It was in single land section of the canal about 300 meter wide. The vessel is owned by the Japanese shipping firm, Shoikisen Kaisha, and the Suez Canal blockade affects not, not only the global shipping industry, but also retailers, supermarkets, and manufacturers in the world. The stranded ship was holding up an estimated $9.6 million of the trade along the water, waterway each day. And furthermore, the blockade could have the global cost of six, from six to $10 billion due to a 0.2 reduction of the annual trade growth with the additional cargo shipping costs between Asia and the Middle East, jumped 47 to $2.2 million. Also, according to the Swells Canal Authority, 12% of the global trade pass, pass, passes through the 193 kilometers canal, which connects to the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea and provides the shortest sea link between Asia and Europe. During the six day blockade, a total of the 369 ships were reported stuck in the tear back waiting to pass through the canal. Well, since 2017, the number of the vessel cargo and net tonnage going through the Swiss Canal has been on the upward trend and marked its highest level in 2022. Uh, no, I'm sorry, 2020, despite the COVID-19 global pandemic. The six-day obstruction by the ever given gave the world sharp lesson on global supply chain dis disruption, putting the Suez Canal Authority under the pressure to un un upgrade the waterways technical infrastructure inf infrastructure to avoid a further destruction in the future. But meanwhile, an alternative route of the Cape of Good Hope in the Africa to Far East can take two weeks longer. 
from this perspective of the risk diversification, it's expanding of the use of the Northern Sea Road via Arctic Ocean has come up as an option for the realizations. So, so comparing with the cargo shipping route from the Far East to Europe via Swiss Canal, the accessibility of the Northern Sea Route could, pr could provide a indisputable advantage in the traveling distance. By using the Northern Sea Route, the navigation distance between Rotterdam and Yokohama, for instance, is only 11,100 kilometers which is nine, uh, 6,900 miles while via conventional Southern route, which is uh, 18,400 kilometer passing through the Suez Canal. The potential of the Northern Sea Route could not only reveal in the reduction of the navigation distance by as much as 40%, but also provide the appropriate development opportunity for the abundant natural resources of mining in the Siberia and Russian Far East regions. With these motivations, Northern Sea Route accessibility presents the commercial potential to facilitate the international shipping and the world market. Well, there is no general agreement on exact what is the exact limits of the Arctic Oceans. And Canada and Russian Federation claim part of the deep water as an internal, internal based, based on historic title and grow, drawing of the straight baselines. However, the Northern Sea Route is the shortest route linking Europe to Asia. Until the 20th century, due to its harsh ice-bound environment, the oceanographic ship conducting survey were the primary, re primary re users and reason to come to this sea. But the ice free period, period in summer has become longer every year and make it the better condition for sailing nowadays. To demonstrate Northern Sea Route as an alternative route for the international shipping market with the potential of saving the 30 days, 13 days between Hamburg and Yokohama. And also the Soviet later started the voyage from Hamburg to Yokohama, passing through Evo and Antwerp and Rotterdam early in 1967. This demonstration cons cons coincided nicely with the Soviet Union viewpoint. However, at the time, no foreign super accepted the so Soviet offer in 1967, even during the con closure of the Suez Canal during the Six Day War in 1967, which causes the delay and extra expenses offsetting the ex expected time and advantage. In recent years, Northern Syria has begun to attract global attention while its importance as a corridor of global importance for the transport of national and international cargo we, it will increase due to the climate change. The commodity price and resistance ship Russian regulations and the need to mo modernize maritime infra infrastructure are among the influence on the Northern Sea Route usage. And also economic aspects influence the stakeholder to stakeholders choice of the route. According to the North University, most of the ships passes through the Northern Sea Route water without difficulty nowadays. So I will show the map of the Northern Sea Route in the Russian side. And the burden of the cargo transport in the water area of the Northern Sea Route increased from 40 to 31.5 million tons between from between 2014 and 2019. The number of transit voyage and cargo volumes via Northern Sea Route grow slowly, but significant increase was seen in 2020. During this incomplete four month period, the total amount of the cargo flows for 64 voyages reached 1.28 million tons. The major share of the cargo transport was iron, oil, 
and concentrates of the one million tons. If flights and bunker price are low, the economic advantage of the using the Northern Syrian versus using the Southern route is quickly lost. If the difference in commodity price between the Europe and Asian markets equalize, the rationale for the sending goods through the Arctic is limited. Conversely, consistency high commodity price would be driving driving force for the international transit transportation in the Northern Sea The number of the usage of the Northern Sea is booming in 20, 2021. The LNG tanker Christophe de Marriage started her travel on January 5th, 2021 from the port of Saveta, Russia, arriving, arriving in Jensu, China on January 20, 27th with the 11 days of the iceberg breaker assistance. This shows that the navigation in the Northern Sea might cause severe problem in the future, such as oil spills or shipwrecks or running aground, as happened in the Suez Canal. Compared to the other seas, sea route, the Northern Sea route is still under development. While equip, equipment and facilities in investment along the cost necessary for responding to research, rescue, and oil spills are still inadequate since the Northern Sea Route is very vulnerable, vulnerable compared to the Southern Oceans. Act, active capital investment and legislation are crucial challenges in implementing usage of the Northern Sea Route. Nevertheless, shipping costs for Northern Sea Road are still unable to comp compete with West Canal usage and with the current super large container ships in use. Since unique skill and expertise are required to sail in the Arctic Oceans, the Russian government introduces the permission system in the passage of Northern Sea Route, and they set the condition where shipping activities are permitted based on sailing seasons or ice conditions. Under certain conditions escorted by ice, Russian icebreakers, operate, uh, Russian icebreakers, it's necessary, necessary to obtain permissions. Well, unclosed Article 234, ice covered area indicates like this in the slides. And such law and regulation by Russia shall have a due regard to navigation and to the protection and prevention of the marine environment based on the best available scientific evidence. Because of the sens sensitiveness and harsh environment in the Arctic, such Russian law Russian regulation seems rational act and harmonize with UNCLOS Article 234, I think. Well, the, at the same time, I would like to explain about the main problem of the Northern Sea Road nowadays. And the main problem is the absence of the emergency evacuation system and the prevention of the medical assistance to crew members of the seagoing ship in the water area of the Northern Sea Road. As of 2021, there are only three bases, Dixon, Pevek, and Tixi in Russian sea coast for the risk, risk, certain rescue purpose. Considering the harsh condition in the Arctic Oceans, the search and rescue measures for the emergency are desirable, but it remains doubtful if they could provide sufficient assistance in critical circumstances. On 26 October 20, 2020, last year, Prime Minister Putin of Russia formally adopted a new strategy for developing the Russian Arctic Arctic zone and ensuring the national security through 2035. And the new strategy also pointed out the delay in the development of the 
structure in Northern Sirius. The construction of the icebreakers and rescue and a, a, a fleet in regard to the deadline for implementation of the economic project in the Arctic, Arctic zone. The limited number of the ice class vessel for business, especially in the winter season, is another critical issue. In recent years, the summer sailing period has been expanding due to the decrease in the sea ice, which has made it easier to co coordinate cargo demand with the operation schedule of the ice class cargo ships. However, the number of high ice class cargo ships is limited for year-round operations, make it very, very difficult to coordinate schedules and charter fees are very high. Besides the challenge I explained, there are actual developments for the practic practicalizing Northern Syria. According to the new Russian strategy, the fulfillment of the main task in the fields of social development of Northern Syria is ensured through the implementation of measures, such as I listed in the slides by organization of the medical support of foreign navigation of the ship and so on. Despite the well-planned start strategy, the allocation of the financial support has not been coordinated, making for, uh, for uncertainty in realizing the project. Nevertheless, more dialogue among the stakeholders of the shipping in investigation and energy firm have, have begun, perhaps leading to concrete actions it is believed that Northern Sea Road usage actualization will be accelerated soon if these infrared lectures are prepared well. So in the last slide, I will, I would like to explain about future prospect and concluding remarks. As Singapore has been an Asian hub for the Swiss Canal, Japan have a great potential to be the hub for the Northern Sea Road, especially in Hokkaido, the northern part of the Japan. The Hokkaido Region Development Bureau, utilizing the satellite AIS data system for the de development for ocean, Arctic Ocean shipping routes. With the exceptional connectability of the global air transportation, port in Japan have a great potential to be the Northern Sea hub for the Asian Pacific regions in shipping, scientific research, and Arctic tourism. The Northern Sea also opened the possibility for the hydrogen power supply chain by uh, existing hydrogen transportation activities and local supply chain capability on the source abundant areas. Increasing the level of activity is key to growth, which will lower the cost of the hydrogen and increase supply chain opportunities. Pro pro progressing in building hydrogen fuel power will not only contribute to high efficient shipping, but also the emerging system for clean energy. The system and infrastructure still require the substances, research and development input in to generate the economic scale of the return. Also, the Asia Pacific has become the fastest growing region, implying the considerable environment burden. Our my compre comprehensive economic assessment of the Northern Sea Road also projected trade flow in good at the inter and intra integration scale. Even if the Northern Sea Road is not cost com competitive compared with the Swiss Canal, Canal Road regarding its flight fees, its time effectiveness for high value added good is highly anticipated. As one of the supply for the key components for automobiles, machinery, and electric, electric equipment, the clean transportation and hydrogen society initiated by Japan could generate the spillover effect on shipbuilding and infrastructure upgrade in the regions. 
creating harm harmony between human activities and oceans. The 2021 Swiss Canal obstruction provide valuable lesson for the global shipping industry regarding the logistics of the cargo overloading and motivated firms and state to consider the risk diversifications. Although the Northern Sea Route cannot currently compete with the current Swiss Canal route in terms of the tr transportation cost and sustainable demands in the shipping market, it should be gain attention as, as a alternative to the Swiss Canal for diversification risk. For more importantly, the economic assessment of the potential of the Northern Sea Route will also encourage more discussion on research and development and international regulation to achieve the energy efficiency and eco-friendly transportation. The emerging need for the merits of the active route and its usage will attract potential funding and encourage stakeholders re-examine the regulations and increase interdependence on the sustainable development of, of the Arctic Ocean. Thank you very much for the kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Hataya. Um, all of our speakers have run a little bit late, so we're actually um, uh, have rather limited time for questions. And we're going to proceed as follows. Um, Professor Zhang Zhihua, who is in the uh, in Sanya Auditorium has kindly agreed to deal with questions that are being posed with a live audience. I will first deal with a few questions that we have um, online and you can submit these to the chat function. Our time is again limited, so please keep your questions short and the answers will necessarily be short as well. I'm gonna start with Nong Hong who has two questions, I believe. Go ahead, Nong, please. Thank you. Thank you, Golan. I do have a question for one for Aldo, one for Susanna. Uh, Aldo, so uh, when we talk about this uh, uh, Arctic Corridor Initiative, what is the status right now? It's already occurred in some of the routes or it's like uh, still under consideration. And also in when it uh, becomes feasible, is it like more looking at the local shipping or it's open to international? Uh, shipping as well. For Suzanne, I think I like your presentation, how you elaborate how the US and Canada, despite their difference and they make agreement to disagree with the legal uh, argument and then come up with a very practical uh, cooperation solution. So, and then your point is that because the US and Canada, their uh, strategy allies and very uh, respect each other. So it it's easy for the two countries to reach consensus and come up with this model. So I'm wondering because the Northwest Passage in the future, uh, when the weather and everything, when it becomes feasible as Northern Sea Route, and there will be a more open for international company uh, commercial shipping. So is the current model of US Canada be applied to other bilateral arrangement like say uh, Canada, and China, for instance, and Canada, South Korea, for instance. Well, what's your viewpoint of the looking to the future? Thank you. Gordon here, just for a moment. We're looking for shorthand responses from you both, so I can do justice to the other questioners. Um, Aldo first, please. Thank you for that very good question, Nong. So the corridors are not formally designated yet, but uh, the traffic uh, that I show data for is already happening. Um, the uh, corridors will be open for all shipping, international or domestic. And uh, so, for instance, for transits uh, through the Northwest Passage, uh, clearly uh, the primary routes would, uh, would apply. The other point I should mention too is that the routes, even the corridors, even though they will be designated, they will be voluntary. Thank you. Suzanne, please, a brief one. Um, just to respond quickly, um, thank you so much for your wonderful question, um, Nong. Um, listen, the arrangements at the moment, neither has sacrificed their legal position. So I, I would assume Canada would seek that kind of, um, let's uh, not touch our legal positions and just move on and, and find ways to collaborate. And I think it would be 
uh, Canada would be willing and interested in that kind of collaboration with, with others, definitely. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to um, now pose another question, which has been received. And we, again, we're going to make the question. I'll make this very quick, reading this out loud. Um, a question for Dr. Hataya. China proposed the Polar Silk Road in 2017. The focus of the Polar of PSI cooperation projects are shipping and energy. Is Japan interested in joining the Polar Silk Road projects? Does Japan have its own shipping cooperation project with Russia? Thank you. Over to you, uh, Dr. Ataya, and the response will have to be short. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I don't have information about the Silk Road, but I can answer that the Japanese private company Mitsui OSK Liners is now acting actively co cooperate with Russian government to do the project in the Northern Sea Road. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Otai. And the last online question before we turn back to the uh, audience. Um, this is from um, the Center for International Law at the National University of Singapore. Question is for Nong, please. Uh, what are the implications of China's identification of being a near Arctic state, quote unquote? Nong, please. Uh, thank you for the question. I personally will use uh, China, will use uh, different terminology to phrase China's role as an uh, Arctic stakeholder instead, uh, instead of near Arctic. By, but no matter what the phrase uh, turned out to be, I think it's very important to recognize the fact that for China to become an uh, observer in Arctic Council and it respect all the sovereignty and also sovereign right claim for all these uh, lead, uh, Arctic literal states. That's very important. And then the other uh, important message that can fail in uh, China's Arctic policy is that it emphasize we respect that in addition to the international legal framework, we respect all the domestic um, legislation, no matter it's associated with the shipping industry or associated with the energy, uh, energy uh, resource development industry. I think respecting the domestic legislation is very important for China to get uh, a much more saying or be recognized interest in, in this region. Thank you, Nong. And I've gotten a an indication from the organizers, we can go a little bit over time. Uh, we know that there's lots of interest here. And I'm going to pose, uh, before we go to the live audience, a last question, let me think, it's from a law student for Dr. Taya. From your perspective, what is the role of UNCLOS in Arctic governance? I realize that's a big question, but if you wouldn't mind tackling that big question in a short response, I'd be most grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. And I think the, um, well, the, so, so in the respect of the Northern Sea Road, the UNCLOS is very important. And, um, and Russia actually followed the UNCLOS. So I think the UNCLOS is like a, how can I say the standard that we must follow when we use the Northern Sea Road or like other ocean area. And also we need to respect that when we do the activities in the ocean area. Thank you very much. And I cannot answer. <laughs> I thought that was a very good um, a sketch answer to a very uh, tough question. I, I now would like to turn to um, um, the uh, vice moderator, uh, Professor Zhang, uh, to see if there are questions from the live audience. Uh, Professor, please. Thank you, Professor Holden. It's very nice to uh, assist you to, to, to chair this session. Uh, before I open the floor uh, on site, I would like to take uh, the pro prerogative to, to, to raise two questions for our uh, Two speakers. One is for Professor uh, Adar, and the other one is for the Dr. Hong Nong. Uh, Professor Adar raised uh, a very uh, interesting uh, topic regarding to the Canadian uh, Arctic Corridor Initiative. 
uh, we are very uh, uh, impressed by this kind of uh, initiative, actually. Uh, as a Chinese, we, we, to some extent, we are quite proud. We, as a nation, we are very good at, at learning as, a, as other uh, regions practice. So uh, um, my question is how to promote uh, this kind of uh, Colorado initiative uh, uh, in a regional level or international level? Uh, but in to what extent this kind of initiative uh, in conformative or, or in against it, uh, the, for example, like I think to, uh, Two, three, four, or all the international street, international street regime, uh, and I'm also very impressed. Uh, uh, Canadian folks on to provide a public uh, service uh, on shipping load. Uh, it uh, could pr provide a, a very good uh, example. We uh, do you think it's it's possibility for China to provide this kind of uh, South China Sea? Coral, coral uh, sea land in this, uh, because it's a very heavy traffic in South China Sea. And what might uh, United States were reaction? That's the first question. The second one is for the uh, Dr. Hong. Uh, the, uh, Chinese, we have a sort of how, how, this kind of golden rule. Uh, do not do. Uh, do not do what you do not want others to do to you. Uh, but we see a lot of concern when we participate in Antarctic governance. Uh, the, some people think China is too aggressive. Uh, China uh, to, uh, to, to set its footing, foot, footing, uh, footprint too much. And the other thing, China is too conservative. So uh, based on your study, based on your uh, observation, uh, uh, how shall we uh, adopt this, what I have mentioned before, this kind of is that could it be a guidance uh, for China to participate in the uh, article uh, uh, governance? And now I would like to open the floor in our conference room. Uh, is there any people uh, want to raise question? Uh, before you raise question, please identify yourself and keep your question short and concise. Uh, maybe we uh, back to Professor Holden. Uh, is that possible for uh, okay. Professor Aldo and Dr. Hong to answer my two questions? Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. And as, after that, I have another question that has come in on the um, on the chat function. So over to our two panelists, and then I'll read a, a question subsequent to that. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very very interesting question. And, uh, and I suppose the question is, is a big one in the sense that uh, uh, to what extent is the idea of corridors useful for other marine regions uh, generally? And uh, um, in a sense, uh, if we think in terms of uh, uh, corridors, what we're actually thinking about is a system of routing measures, routing and actually the Canadian Arctic also reporting measures, as there is also in the, in the Russian Arctic. But uh, focusing for a moment about on the routing measures, uh, there is already very extensive IMO practice with the designation of routes. Uh, you see the, the IMO here finds legal authority in UNCLOS, but also SOLAS, the International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea, Chapter 5, uh, Safety of Navigation, and also the Collision Avoidance Regulations, which would be regulation term for traffic separation schemes, for example. And, uh, and these instruments provide authority for the IMO to designate routes and other measures. So the routes could be actual uh, 
routes such as deep water routes or areas to be avoided or roundabouts, you name it, there are all kinds of routing measures. And, and they depend on requests from uh, uh, the, the states through whose waters the, the routes uh, uh, will be designated. So, um, so the, to answer your question, basically in the South China Sea context, um, clearly the IMO would have a critical role to play in designating those, those measures. Um, um, the, um, the other point perhaps to mention here is that um, the um, international straits are sort of an interesting kind of situation too, because they are the most protected of navigation routes in the law of the sea convention. And therefore there are some limitations there on the extent to which coastal states themselves can proceed with, uh, with designating any measures before they receive IMO designation. So basically, um, uh, the, the question that you pose is one that requires cooperation, cooperation among regional states and also cooperation through the IMO. Thank you. Aldo, Nong, please. Oh. Uh, thank you, Zhuhua, for bringing a very complicated question. I think it's, uh, I tend to totally agree with you when China is uh, articulate its policy and also expand its uh, engagement with other countries. Many of activities will be, uh, receive a lot of skepticism of what's your real intention in the Arctic. It's very hard, but I think China has done um, my understanding, China has done a great job. First of all, by recognizing a sovereign claim of the little state. And second, in order to be in, engaging other governors, it emphasized, for instance, a lot of its efforts on cooperating with the little state and also emphasized efforts on research uh, proposals and particularly on climate change through those lower sensitive issues. And China has been increasing its efforts in regional or bilateral or regional international cooperation in, in these areas. And, and then and also has been uh, established a couple of research stations with Nordic countries. There are a lot of very good example. And as you said, Jisoo, uh, we will see them. I think I would like to give the example to other countries, for instance, who uh, picture itself as a stakeholders in the South China Sea, for instance. And you should do what China does in, in, in the Arctic, for instance, for a extra regional countries be, uh, when you show your interest in the South China Sea, which I've been talking for a lot uh, from uh, yesterday and today as well, I believe in the other in the other room on the international law panel. So it's very important to recognize the, um, the legitimate interests of the leader states and you have to recognize their sovereignty and sovereign claims. And then when you are involved in uh, issues such as shipping navigation and it's very important to take into consideration of its national legislation in accordance with international law and there was some certainly some um, particular reason for countries to interpret many of its national legislation in terms of navigation i think it's very, very important to recognize for instance when you are a coastal state you have your legitimate interests like economic you know, interests in your eez when you are non leader states and you have an interest in navigation but it's always very important to recognize or respect each others no matter you are a coastal state or you are a user state it's very important to recognize each others and not to uh, any for mutual respect. I, I think you, I hope I answered the question, Jeffa. Oh, I think you did a great job, Noah. I have a question from Sylvia Zhang um, for Aldo. Uh, given the nature of the quarter compliance is to be voluntary, how do you think of the status of compliance vis-a-vis -vis Canada's position on the legal status of the Northwest Passage might be affected? Aldo, please. Uh, another good question. I frankly do not think it will be affected because uh, the, the fact that uh, the, um, the corridors will, uh, will be open to all shipping or, and they'll be voluntary and there are no charges essentially means that navigation is encouraged. So essentially the 
if you look at what Canada is doing, in a sense, it is uh, avoiding the issue of the legal status of the waters and instead actually making navigation through the region accessible and on the basis of a higher level of safety. Thank you, Aldo. I'm going to use the privilege of, of moderator to pose a question to Suzanne. And Suzanne, you gave us a very complete picture of the deep cooperation between the United States Maritime Authorities and the Canadian Maritime Authorities, based in part, a large measure, perhaps, on the historical relationship between the two countries. But can you imagine circumstances where Canada would be as willing or willing to have similar cooperation with third countries and their Coast Guards, for example? Um, I think you're right. I mean, in, in um, the uh, Arctic policy under the Harper government, uh, I think the U.S. was described as our premier partner in the in the Arctic. So, kind of uh, distinguishing between our friends and classifying the Americans as as our our, our best friends. Um, I think though that there are, in terms of uh, Coast Guard, uh, the uh, Arctic Coast Guard Forum. There are also on the kind of armed forces side of things, joint operations with uh, colleagues. And I was a bit um, arbitrary. I mean, in Opnanuk, there's often also Danish participation. De uh, Denmark sends some ships and uh, exercises with Canada and the US. And so I think there is a larger participation, but I think you put your finger on it. I think there is something special about the Canadian American relationship. And I think it's only normal, it's, uh, you know, uh, it is the Arctic, but it's a special part of the Arctic, the North American Arctic with its own challenges and realities. We uh, hopefully can continue to understand those challenges and, and, and work together. So I'm not sure if, if that answers your question, but I think there is ongoing uh, uh, collaboration that's broader than just uh, bilateral. Thank you very much, uh, Suzanne. Uh, before closing the session, I just want to check again with uh, Professor Jung if there are any other questions from the live audience. Uh, before we wrap this up. Uh, Professor Zhang. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Holden. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, perhaps uh, if, if it's time allowed, uh, I, I raise another question. Uh, what is the best practice uh, during the uh, Antarctica uh, load uh, uh, sea land uh, uh, sea land, communi uh, sea land communication uh, the, the governance in, in terms of sea land uh, communication in an Antarctic region uh, what is the main gap uh, current exists still uh, not uh, resolved uh, very well uh, in this issue uh may i uh, ans uh, ask this uh, question may i put this question to professor susanna thank you Uh, thank you very much for your uh, your question. I um, I think I'm going to blame the darkness and the time of, of the night, uh, just to be sure that I understood your question. Perhaps uh, what what I might see as a as a gap that remains uh, in terms of the Canadian Arctic and our maybe our collaboration with the uh, United States. Uh, um, I just if I could just say the first thing that came to my mind was infrastructure but of course as Aldo explained the corridors initiative is trying to counter that problem to fill that gap and to locate infrastructure to try and and invest in the best used routes corridors uh, and position uh, and and offer those services so I'm, I'm terribly sorry if I didn't quite uh, catch the uh, and I would submit it's a it's an issue for the Americans as well uh, in Alaska and uh, I, I suppose uh, on, on vessels as well, uh, uh, it, it is difficult to get them built and, and, and uh, on the water. But um, I'm sorry if I didn't quite uh, understand the question. Maybe, Aldo, you would like to contribute. Um. Uh, one issue I see with the Antarctic regime is uh, the Environmental Liability Annex, which uh, has as yet to enter into force is unclear in terms of how it would interface 
with the other existing legal regimes for civil liability for oil pollution damage, for example, and the International Oil Pollution Compensation Fund. Um, because uh, the, the Environmental Liability Annex is based on the Conventional Limitation of Liability for Maritime Claims of 1976, as amended. But these regimes have not been coordinated uh, in the context of uh, Antarctic water. So, so the day the Environmental Liability Annex comes into force, I think we'll have some legal issues we need to sort out. That's the one that comes across as a gap at this time. At this point, I'd like to thank um, all of our speakers, but also the invisible heroes who are the translators who've put up with our sometimes too quick prose and done a first rate job. I, I'd also like to, um, uh, to thank um, uh, Yu Qian and uh, Shi Jinyi, um, Professor Zhang, and the, of course, the host organization, National Institute for South China Sea Studies. Uh, who have been made such superb uh, organizational arrangements and made this discussion of a very important topic possible. I thank you all, but please join me in thanking, in particular, our speakers. I now declare this session closed. Thank you. <laughs>